It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Bronstein. Um, many of you might know he works on geometric deep learning and gives fantastic lectures, which can go on for hours, I think. I've certainly watched some of them. Um, so he's a professor at Oxford, endowed by DeepMind, um, is also quite entrepreneurial and has spun out a few companies, the latest of which was acquired by Twitter, where he worked on geometric deep learning for Twitter. And uh, really excited to, to learn more about uh, what he has to say. So thank you for joining us, Michael. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. And thanks to Nathan for organizing this, uh, this wonderful event. So um, I would like to talk about uh, geometric deep learning. And you can think that these uh, terms are actually may maybe not necessarily fit together, right? So what's the relation between uh, geometry and, and deep learning? And um, I would like actually to hopefully to inspire you with this beautiful quote from, from Weil, who was one of the most important mathematicians of the 20th century. And he spoke a little bit poetically about uh, a very important concept, which is symmetry. And he said that as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning, it's uh, one idea by which man through the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and uh, perfection. So symmetry is actually uh, is a Greek term, and it goes back to ancient Greece. And Plato, for example, believed that, that symmetric solids, what we nowadays call platonic solids, uh, are the basic building blocks of the universe. So they are so perfect that probably all the stuff around us should be built uh, from tiny little symmetric uh, objects. And it's, if you think of it, it's not such a crazy idea because uh, th that's how crystals are organized. And uh, he recognized geometry as uh, the uh, queen of mathematics. And a legend says that uh, an inscription on the entrance of his academy said that nobody who is not skilled in geometry should uh, be allowed to enter. Now, uh, the Greeks also are credited with uh, building the formal foundations of geometry and the famous postulates of Euclid. And that's the, the geometry that we still teach as the geometry at school, right? Euclidean geometry. And as you probably know, one of these postulates stood out and uh, for many hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, uh, a row of illustrious mathematicians tried to do something with it, tried to prove uh, it to no avail until the 19th century where it was for the first time recognized that uh, you can actually abolish it altogether and create different types of geometries that were called non-Euclidean geometries. So this monopoly of Euclid that stood for more than 2,000 years was finally shattered. And what it created is a world of different geometries, uh, a, a remarkable universe, as one of the authors of uh, these approaches called it, uh, Janos Boyei. And uh, it also created this kind of a mess where it was not clear what actually defines in geometry and how they're related to each other. And uh, in 1872 came forth uh, Felix Klein. So he was a young mathematician, only 23 years old, when he got an appointment as a full professor at the University of Erlangen in Germany, which is a quite remarkable feat uh, even by modern times. And um, he was asked in his inaugural talk, as it was customary in Germany and still customary, I think, to present uh, his uh, research prospectus, uh, which entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program where he suggested a radically new approach to geometry, basically to think of it as some space uh, uh, together with a group of transformations. So essentially, he was studying what kind of properties of geometric objects would be preserved if we apply certain type of transformation to this object. So for example, Euclidean geometry, according to this theory, uh, arises from rigid motions, which preserves areas, parallelism, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, basically, this group theoretic approach was uh, really redefined geometry in the 19th century. It had profound impact uh, on mathematics, maybe more in a cultural sense. But it also had a profound impact on physics, where uh, in the beginning of the 20th century came first the realization that actually some of the basic laws of the universe uh, could be derived from first principles of symmetry. So the famous uh, theorem of any Noether, any Noether, for example, that showed uh, that you can derive conservation laws of physics that before that were considered to be empirical from uh, considerations of symmetry. So together, along with ideas of Weil himself that I, I, I quoted in the beginning, this uh, created the new physics of the 20th century. And uh, physicists like to distinguish between what they call external symmetries, right? the symmetries of the space-time. So what is uh, shown here is called the, the Poincaré group that gives rise to the Minkowski geometry of the, the, of the special uh, uh, relativity and the, the symmetries of quantum fields that uh, give rise to different 
uh, interactions or different forces. So basically all the standard model, right, that very accurately describes the particles that we know nowadays can be totally derived uh, from uh, the considerations of symmetry. And I think nobody put it better than uh, Philip Anderson, Nobel laureate in physics, saying that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, you can wonder at this point, what does it all have to do with deep learning, right? So, and that's probably the purpose I was invited to here to talk. I, I'm not a physicist, so uh, these are uh, these things uh, that I know only uh, roughly about. So if you look at deep learning, I think there is no doubt that uh, it has really created a revolution in data science as well as in applied fields. But it also uh, brought some kind of historical luggage. So many of the architectures uh, that are popular in deep learning, like convolutional neural networks, were historically developed for working on domains such as images, right? And other architectures like recurrent neural networks or LSTMs were developed for time series or sequences. Or graph neural networks originated from chemistry dealing with molecular graphs. So uh, what we try to do with geometric deep learning is in the spirit of the Erlangen program of Felix Klein, to bring some common foundations, basically to be able to derive existing architectures from first principles of symmetry and other uh, principles that are inspired by physics, as well as provide a blueprint that would allow to develop new architectures for, uh, that, that would serve uh, specific problems. And I will show a few examples from, uh, from chemistry and drug design. So if you look at machine learning problems, at least in their very simple, maybe trivialized setting, right? So if the, the famous example of cats and dogs, right? So imagine that you have, you need to design a neural network or some black machine learning black box that distinguishes between uh, images of cats and dogs. So uh, you have an input, right, which is an image. Uh, you do something to this input and you output a binary label. It's a cat or a dog. So what is put in this uh, black box is a good question and the answer, if probably you, you asked it 30 years ago or 40 years ago, would be different. So there have been waves of popularity of different methods. But I think nowadays, without any doubt, uh, what you put in this uh, black box is a neural network, right? And neural networks are by no, no means uh, new. Uh, the first uh, works on artificial neural networks go back to the 50s or even before. The famous work of uh, Frank Rosenblatt on perceptrons is from 1957. And uh, what we know about these neural networks uh, from the mathematical perspective, that they're what is called universal approximators. So you can take uh, a very simple architecture which connects just two layers of perceptrons and you can represent any continuous function to any desired degree of accuracy. So basically it is so rich that you can express almost anything that, 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 that you want. And of course, it comes at the expense that uh, if you now ask uh, how many samples, for example, I need to, uh, to take of my, uh, of my data to represent functions that have certain regularity properties, right? And the mathematicians have very well established uh, uh, terminology when uh, coming to, to, uh, to talk about regularity, like let's say Lipschitz continuous functions. The answer would be, it will be so humongously large that we will not have enough cats and dogs around to show as examples, right? So it will be uh, commensurable with the number of particles in the universe. So it's simply intractable, right? And uh, this problem has been recognized uh, under different names. One of them is the curse of dimensionality, and it has really been kind of a roadblock uh, uh, in the very beginning of the life of uh, artificial neural networks. You can also say that it was one of the reasons for the demise of these methods in the 60s, the, the so-called AI winter. But it also provided uh, uh, probably motivation to look beyond and to look for new architectures that you can maybe post factum recognize as the first examples of geometric architectures, and I'm talking about convolutional neural networks and their precursors, the, the neocognitrons of Fukushima. And uh, the idea of these methods was to uh, cope with this problem, the curse of dimensionality, and the problem to scale uh, to very large uh, uh, data by uh, weight sharing and uh, locality. So the idea in this, uh, in this kind of neural networks, and they work on grids, on images, is that you have uh, some kind of local filter that operates on nearby pixels and you apply it everywhere in the image. So you have the same parameters, so the number of parameters doesn't depend on the, on the image size and as a result you uh, this way effectively break the curse of dimensionality. Now if you look at this uh, architecture from the geometric perspective, here we have an instance of what is called translation invariance, right? And that's exactly the kind of symmetries that Klein uh, introduced in, uh, in his Erlangen program. So if I want to classify an image of a cat, right? I don't care where the cat is located in the image. So I want my architecture by design to be able to tell me that, that uh, if I translate my uh, signal within, uh, on this grid, the output should be the, sa the same 
no matter how I translate it, right? So that's what we call translation invariance. And these principles can be applied to other uh, geometric domains. So grids are just one example, but you can also apply it to graphs. You can apply it to manifolds and many other, maybe more exotic uh, objects that you maybe uh, rarely encounter in machine learning, but at least you can do interesting mathematics about. So let me talk about graphs because graphs are interesting. As you probably know, graphs arise uh, a lot in chemistry. Actually, the term graph itself, uh, as understood in the graph theory, was introduced by, uh, by James Sylvester in the end of the 19th century in the context of uh, structural chemical formula. So he used uh, the term graph to refer to these uh, first uh, attempts to think of molecules as some atoms connected by, by bonds. So somehow, always graph theory has, uh, has been working hand in hand with with chemistry. So here is an example of a small graph that represents a molecule. And probably some of you, uh, actually all of you would be familiar with it, maybe without even uh, explicitly acknowledging it. So this is what you have been drinking outside in the coffee break. So this is a molecule of caffeine. And uh, it has a bunch of atoms, right? And a bunch of chemical bonds. And we uh, often would like to predict its chemical or physical properties, right? So this is a, a classical problem in uh, virtual drug screening and drug design. So imagine that this is a candidate drug, and caffeine is a drug, right? So it's a drug-like molecule. So uh, you want to predict, for example, how uh, well it binds to a certain receptor, or whether it is toxic, or whether you can dissolve it in water. So these are very practical problems uh, that, that require answers to. And of course, you can try to uh, train a neural network to, that will take as input uh, this kind of uh, molecular graphs and will uh, spit out their properties that you're interested in. The problem here is that we don't have a particular order for the nodes of this graph, right? I cannot input a graph in a computer, so I need to represent it as some kind of vector or a matrix, right? And if I do it, the problem is that I can order the nodes of the molecule in an arbitrary way, right? So uh, basically there is some built-in uh, ambiguity that is inherent to this kind of, uh, of data that I, I need to acknowledge and, uh, and deal with in my architecture in order to be able to deal with these kind of structures. And uh, the, this property, again, if you look at it from the geometric perspective, is what is called permutation invariance. So no matter how I order the atoms in a molecule, uh, obviously the physical or the chemical properties of this molecule will not change, right? So I want my architecture to have this as a built-in constraint, right? So I want permutation invariance by design. So the way that it is implemented, well, there are multiple ways of implementing uh, permutation invariance, but uh, the architecture that existed probably for many years now uh, in different forms or under different names, but the, maybe in the past years have become extremely popular, and these are graph neural networks. And graph neural networks, what they do, they uh, use the input graph also as a computational tool to aggregate information from neighbors, right? So if I have an atom that is connected by a bond to, to, uh, to another atom, I will, uh, basically I will look at all the neighbors of the, the atom that is here shown in, uh, highlighted in yellow, and I will uh, aggregate this uh, neighbor information, and I can do it at every uh, node in the graph, right? And I can do it multiple times, so I will have multiple layers. So uh, this is exactly the same idea that we had in convolutional neural networks, just applied to a less structured domain, right? So locality and weight sharing. And if we do it, uh, we do it once, uh, we see that the output that we are getting will change in the same way as uh, we change the input, right? So if I change the order of the atoms in the input, the order of the features that I'm producing by this procedure, will change uh, exactly in the same way. So this is a, a special type of invariance that we call equivariance, right? Changing in the same way rather than remaining, uh, remaining unchanged. And we can do multiple such layers. Uh, typically, uh, these neural networks are not very deep. It depends on the application. And then we can do an invariant readout if we are interested in just single number or maybe a vector of uh, properties that we are trying to predict for this, uh, for this molecule. So basically, the, the output layer will be uh, a permutation invariant readout. Now, so far, this is just the symmetry of the domain itself, right? So uh, basically, the, the, the property that underlies any graph-related problem, which tells us that uh, I don't want to care about how the, uh, the atoms in the molecule are ordered. We also, when we deal with molecules, in particular, our graphs are not just arbitrary uh, abstract uh, constructions. They uh, are geometric graphs, right? So they live in some Euclidean space. So what I mean by this is that Every node in the graph, in addition, for example, to properties like the, the type of the atom that, that appears in this molecule, also have geometric coordinates, right? 
but I don't again, I don't have a canonical placement of the molecule in space. This is something that is rather arbitrary. So uh, these additional coordinates, I want that my, uh, all my procedure that I do on the graph, uh, if I transform the molecule by rotating or translating it, will be invariant under these uh, transformations. And this is what is called often uh, SE3 invariance, SE standing for the special Euclidean group. So basically this includes rotations and translations, but not reflections. And you can consider other symmetries as well. So uh, again here, uh, for, for in, in chemical language, what we'd like to say that the properties, the chemical or the physical properties of a molecule are not supposed to change uh, if we, for example, rotate and translate it, which is obviously a very uh, reasonable and very meaningful uh, requirement that, that can be built into this architecture. Now, why this is important, and as I mentioned in the beginning, graph neural networks have become an uh, important tool in drug discovery and virtual drug screening. So if you look at the space of small molecules that could be potential drug candidates, uh, it is uh, humongously large, right? So it's uh, estimates vary, but probably something like 10 to the power of 60. So it's totally unimaginable number. So just for comparison, the number of particles in the universe is something like 10 to the power uh, 80. So we're close to this number, right? So it's, you cannot test these molecules in the lab, right? So you cannot even, even enumerate them, right? So we don't even have probably enough computer memory to store all these potential molecules in memory. So it's, it's just, just a number, just some kind of combinatorial bound. Now, at the very end, we, of course, we want to test these molecules in the lab. So there might be maybe a few hundreds or a few thousands, maybe with recent high throughput technologies for some type of tasks, we can test hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of molecules, but still the gap between uh, hundreds of thousands or, or millions and 10 to the power of 60 is huge, right? So we need to bridge it somehow by computational methods. And uh, of course, historically, there have been methods that were developed for uh, screening uh, molecules or predicting their properties, like uh, quantum, uh, uh, quantum mechanical simulations or uh, density functional theory. So graph neural networks have been shown to, be, uh, to excel at some property prediction while being orders of magnitude faster than the, the traditional methods. And this was really a big excitement probably a few years ago, and uh, this is uh, still ongoing process, and uh, research uh, in this field is evolving very fast, and more people are, I think, are joining the community. And uh, just to give you an example, in 2020, there was this famous paper from the group of Jim Collins at MIT, published in Cell, which is one of the, the main biological journals, where they used uh, graph neural networks in a virtual screening pip pipeline to uh, discover new antibiotics. And as you probably know, we are running out of antibiotics. Uh, I think the estimate is about 2 million people dying every year from antibiotic-resistant resi uh, microorganisms. So uh, it's just probably a matter of time when we have a pandemic that is caused by uh, a bacterium that, that uh, just cannot be killed by anything that we have in our pharmaceutical arsenal. So there is really an urgent need for discovering new antibiotic substances that can deal with these resistant bacteria, and that's what they, uh, they found. They actually found that a molecule that was initially tested as an anti-diabetic drug called halicin had uh, a broad spectrum of antibiotic activity against uh, some of the most nasty and resistant bacteria. So talking about uh, applications in this field, uh, everybody here probably heard about AlphaFold, right? So the DeepMind. Uh, uh, entry with a, big, uh, with a big bang into structural biology, predicting protein folding from amino acid sequences, one of the holy grail problems in this field. So AlphaFold 2 is based on uh, geometric principles as well. So uh, one of the important pieces in the architecture uh, is what they call invariant point attention. So it's a form of graph neural network or a transformer that, that exactly has this kind of uh, equivariant uh, properties. And obviously it was a, a big uh, breakthrough in uh, in the field of structural biology, appeared on the cover of Nature, and now is being used uh, around the world by all, uh, probably all labs that work in this field. So myself, with uh, with my collaborators in Switzerland, the, uh, the group of Bruno Correa uh, from the uh, EPFL um, Protein Engineering Lab, so we developed some of the first uh, deep learning architectures based on geometric principles for design of proteins, so in a sense, uh, an inverse problem to, to what is solved in protein folding, where we treated uh, protein molecules as uh, geometric objects, as surfaces, and then basically this way we abstract out the, uh, the, the complicated intricacies of the fold, and then we expose only the, the molecular surface that is important, for example, for predicting how proteins interact and how they, they, they bind together. And this allowed us uh, in next stages to design uh, new protein binders that would target uh, 
some pharmaceutical therapeutic targets that would be otherwise difficult to drug. So this is a class of drugs that are based on proteins that are called biologics or biological drugs, and they typically uh, are better in uh, targeting interfaces that are flat. So typically a, a drug will look like a small thing that will stick into a pocket in the protein surface. Many proteins don't have these pockets. So when they have a flat interface, it's easier to drug them with a protein. And here you can see two examples of uh, two designed binders. One is for uh, PDL1 target. So this is a target used for immunotherapy in oncology. And uh, potentially uh, immunotherapy uh, allows you to address some types of cancer that maybe a decade ago would, would have been a death sentence for the patient. So the second binder that is shown here is actually a, a binder for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus. That's uh, the, the thing that terrorized us for the last three years and probably still uh, still around. I managed to catch it uh, a few weeks ago, so uh, it's still there, even though much milder. And the image here was actually uh, a design that Nature uh, asked us to prepare for the cover, so that, that paper appeared in the beginning of May in Nature, but they chose something else, of course, uh, because we paid for it. Uh, here it is, I'm showing it. <laughs> so maybe just a few words about uh, how and the direction in which this field is moving. So by analogy to, uh, to Mid Journey or DALI and all these uh, generative AI uh, so-called models that allow you to generate these cool pictures, like you, you type in a prompt, like painting of an astronaut riding a dog on the moon, and you get this kind of image. That's probably not the best that you can get now. It's already way better with a recent version of me journey. So imagine something like this for chemistry. So I can uh, give you some maybe set of constraints, like I can give you the, the, the geometric structure of the target and now ask you to generate a molecule that would fit, in this case, in, into some protein pocket and will bind to it, right? So uh, basically we are trying to build a molecule that, that, uh, that, that has certain constraints. So this is actually a, a work, again, that, that I'm doing with the same group in Switzerland. Uh, uh, this is geometrically conditioned uh, molecular diffusion model. You can also do it in a different way. So you can start with uh, little fragments that you know how they bind to the, to the target, what is called pharmacophores. And then you try to link them together by some rigid structure that, that holds uh, these pieces together and you get a drug that is composed of these small fragments. So this is a standard procedure in, in structure-based drug, drug design, but uh, so far it has been done mainly by hand. I think machine learning methods like this can uh, facilitate and uh, accelerate uh, significantly the development of these, uh, of these drugs. So just to conclude, well, I hope I convinced you, or at least I gave you a little bit of, uh, of an idea why geometry, how geometry, which is a very old concept that uh, has roots in ancient Greece and uh, the works of Euclid and others, uh, can be used in the modern day, uh, day to understand and design new deep learning architectures that could be used for uh, a bunch of things. Uh, so from three-dimensional virtual avatars to the design uh, of drugs that could potentially cure uh, currently uncurable or difficult diseases. Thank you very much. <laughs>